gentlemen, welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Brooks, and I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Policy Center, and I am delighted to be here this evening. On behalf of the trustees and the fellows of the JPC, I want to thank each of you who came here uh, to join us this evening. I'm delighted to be here because this is truly an extraordinary panel. As you know, they are all exceptional thinkers and speakers, and I am sure that this evening's program will be both thought-provoking, timely, and entertaining. Before I introduce our moderator, I have one bit of clarification of housekeeping that I'd like to make. Some of you know us not as through the work of the Jewish Policy Center, but rather through the Republican Jewish Coalition. The RJC is our sister organization. The JPC, which is hosting this event this evening, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization bringing its own unique brand of policy analysis to the Jewish community. The JPC strongly supports Israel in request for legitimacy and security in the Middle East. We advocate for a strong American defense capability, cooperating closely with Israel and other allied countries. We work hard to bring fiscal responsibility to our government. We work on energy security issues and less reliance on Middle East sources of energy, as well as freedom of speech intellectual diversity issues. We think all of those issues are nonpartisan and something that hopefully all of us can agree upon. At your seat tonight are copies of the JPC's In Focus quarterly magazine, which I encourage you to take home and read. Those of you who are interested in making a financial contribution this evening uh, to support the efforts that we're making in the Jewish community, such as today's policy forum, In Focus, or our expanded and upgraded online capabilities in which we react and respond to real-time events, can do so using the contribution envelopes that are included in the magazine. The JPC is a tax-exempt 501c3 organization. Now tonight, this will not be a rigorously structured discussion, but rather it's intended to be a free-flowing forum. To accomplish this in any meaningful fashion, you need an extraordinary moderator, one who is quick on his feet and fully grounded in the issues. In fact, a moderator who is equal to the panelists in the scope of knowledge and depth of the insights that you will hear. We have one of the best this evening with Michael Medved. As we all know, Michael is a scholar. Michael is a scholar, an author, a film critic, and a radio talk show host, and you all know that you can hear Michael each afternoon from 3 to 6 here in Detroit on WDTK, The Patriot. Also, he has written numerous books. His latest book will be available for purchase uh, after the program in the back. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and indeed my honor to welcome our moderator this evening, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Medved. Thank you everyone for coming out, and, and thank you to Shari Tzedek uh, for uh, being able to convene in this remarkable congregation and this, uh, this very beautiful building. Let me introduce our panel so we can proceed very quickly, and then we will have time and opportunity uh, not only to discuss some of the issues here among ourselves, but to open it up as soon as possible uh, to your questions and comments. Because it, uh, my experience suggests that often Jewish groups aren't shy in communicating opinions and, and questions and discussion. Uh, first of all, Shoshana Bryant is uh, the director of the Jewish Policy Center, and for 30 years she's been involved in military and security and uh, uh, policy analysis. Uh, she was for many years executive director of JINSA, which is the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, and uh, she has taken military and diplomatic expeditions, but particularly military professionals, to the Middle East on uh, many occasions, including 450 American military officers, to engage in discussions uh, with their Israeli counterparts. Daniel Pipes is uh, the president of the Middle East Forum, 
He is known as one of the world's foremost analysts of terrorism and of security matters and the future of the Middle East. He um, has contributed, uh, the Wall Street Journal says Pipes is an authoritative commentator on the Middle East. He uh, has both his PhD and his uh, bachelor's degree from Harvard, which has chosen him as one of its 100 most influential living graduates, which really is something. Uh, John, did you make that list too? You know? I, uh, I didn't get into Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any event, uh, uh, Daniel Pipes is, uh, also has the great distinction of being one of the very rare voices in America who uh, tried to warn the country about the dangers of Islamo-Nazi terror before September 11, 2001. Uh, John Pajares is, I think, known to everyone as the editor of Commentary Magazine. He um, uh, writes the letter from the editor column for Commentary. And I think he's responsible for the new joke feature in Commentary Magazine, which appears every month. And uh, John is a second generation editor of Commentary, of course. I think many of you know the great and, and very important work of his uh, father, uh, Norman Podaritz, or his mother, Midge Dechter, both of whom were profound influences on me uh, when John was even younger than he is now. And, uh, uh, the one thing, John is also a best-selling author. He was a speechwriter for President Reagan. His book, Bush Country, was a national bestseller. He can answer questions about that. And what I didn't realize is John was also a five-time Jeopardy! champion. <laughs> so... Um, that's what's going to be on my tombstone. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going to be on my No, um, it is... What is John Pajares, right? <laughs> that's, that's, what's on, that's what's on the tombstone. All right, the subject matter for tonight is uh, cheerful. It's November, so, but we're coming up to Thanksgiving, so that can be an antidote to some of what we're talking about. We're talking about American decline, the new anti-Semitism, and the fate of Israel. And let me begin with, uh, with Daniel Pipes, um, because I, I was assuming that in terms of American decline, that there would be a consensus that America's influence, particularly in the Middle East, has definitely declined. Recently, everybody's talking about the 50th anniversary of November 22nd, 1963. If you go back and you listen to the debates between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon, there was great concern at that time about America losing what they call prestige, which really meant popularity, which really meant credibility. And this at a time when the United States was vastly admired around the world and was hugely powerful in a way that people would say may have been lost. Uh, Daniel Pipes, is American decline a reality, particularly in view of the recent negotiations with Iran? Thank you, Michael. Yes, American decline is a reality today, but it need not be a reality three and a half years from now. It is a self-inflicted decline. It's a matter of policy, intelligence, will, priority, and unfortunately we have an administration that for five years now has shown poor judgment wrong priorities, and I think more fundamentally than any of that, we have a president who really doesn't think the United States is a force for good in the world, and therefore would rather see the United States less influential. And as president, he's in a pretty good position to make the United States less influential. I like to say that President Obama really would rather be Prime Minister of Belgium than President of the United States. He would rather be one of the guys in the world who goes along with the eager consensus, who doesn't lead, but who follows. And that's the problem we have today, but it's not a deep problem, it's not a permanent problem, it's not a necessary affliction. 
The key for me is who was elected in 2014 and even more importantly in 2016. Shoshana, um, basically uh, we're talking about uh, Belgium and good, good beer and chocolate, but um, everyone knows that Hadaiva chocolate is kosher, right? Yeah, under, under it is. Um, but, uh, and they're not sponsoring this event, unfortunately. Um, but uh, speaking of the EU, did you ever, in your years of security analysis, think we would come to a situation in which the French foreign minister suggested that the United States was being uh, too credulous and, and uh, accepting and uh, not forceful enough in negotiations with Iran and, and would say that America was proposing a sucker's deal? No. No, I never thought I would say that, Michael. But, and only by looking backwards after they did it can you see that it actually was well-rounded in French policy. It is, it is part of a long-term French position. But if you had asked me that morning if the French would be the ones who saved Israel's bacon, excuse me, I would have said no. Yeah, I, I can see the headlines in the local uh, uh, Jewish press. Uh, uh, France saves Israel's bacon. Um, it doesn't no, it doesn't Michael, sound right. Michael, as we are in a, in a sanctuary, I mean, the uh, one parallel one might draw is to the, uh, is to the <coughs> Gentile biblical prophet Balaam, who, uh, you know, ended up, uh, though he wished to uh, curse the Israelite God, found himself praising the Israelite God, though he did not wish to. Um, and I think one can say that the, uh, uh, that Israel's salvation by France, uh, that Laurent Fabieux and, uh, and uh, Prime Minister and President Hollande uh, found themselves maybe a little like Balaam uh, in, in 2013, not, not, not their intended uh, policy toward Israel, but their effective policy toward Israel. Um, do, um, uh, what happens next? Does anyone have some sense of what happens next regarding the Iranian nuclear threat? In the sense of negotiations, what happens next? Or other means. You now have about two weeks in which the United States is prepared to try to pressure the French to sign on to the next deal. There is another meeting coming up, and it is the U.S. desire to have a unified five plus one, so the United States will now begin to exercise pressure on the French to cave. But I think it's not likely to happen. The French really were not acting on Israel's behalf. They were not acting on the Saudi behalf. I think the French were acting on the French behalf. They're very angry with the Obama administration over Syria. They have other reasons to want this for the French. But I think the diplomatic maneuvering will now be between the United States and France. We were speaking before about American decline. Um, Daniel Pipes, has uh, the United States uh, been effective in handling the so-called Arab Spring? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> well, when you ask the question, you laugh and I laugh with you. But there was reason to think, almost three years ago, that there would be something positive coming out of it. And I would argue even today there's something positive coming out of it, which is the following. That the uh, Arabic-speaking countries were from roughly 1970 to 2010 in a stasis. Little happened. One can point to, for example, the leaders. Muammar Gaddafi of Libya who came to power in 1969 and was still there in 2010. And uh, others came to power in 1978, 1981, 1970, and were still there. And there was this uh, loathsome, greedy, repressive dictatorship, and you needed to have something break it. And the break has happened. And although much of what has taken place since then, since three years ago has been uh, unpleasant, uh, miserable, brutal. Still, it is moving things forward. So uh, I think it's better that it happened in 2010 than in 2020, more than it happened in 2000 rather than 2010. This is a necessary process. As for your question, uh, has the U.S. government handled this well? No, certainly not well. There's been no overarching policy. Every single country, every single month has had its own 
variant, as we saw, for example, dramatically in the Syrian case in August. I would propose very briefly three guidelines for the US government to follow year in, year out in this country and that country. Namely, always oppose the Islamists who are our enemy. It's a simple uh, injunction, like saying, always oppose Nazis. It's really easy conceptually, easy operation. Second would be always support those Middle Easterners who look to us for moral and material sustenance, who are liberal, secular, not exactly us, but in trying to move the Middle East out of its uh, stupor into something better. And thirdly, less dogmatically, work with the tyrants, be they military or monarchical or whatever, but always push them towards political participation, towards rule of law, towards opening. I think these three guidelines would serve us very well. The Obama administration has certainly not followed these or any other guidelines, but on an ad hoc basis. For example, stayed away from the Iranian demonstrations of 2009 against the loathsome regime that is our enemy, and endorsed the Egyptian demonstrations of 2011 against a leader who is someone we can work with. It made no sense. There's no logic, there's no integrity. I think. If you consider the range of the Obama foreign policy, what Daniel is saying about the lack of guidelines is a much more global fact, which is to say that this is a foreign policy of no foreign policy, though it has an overarching ideological element to it. Uh, the overarching ideological element is the wanting to be the Prime Minister of Belgium, or as Elliot Abrams said in a commentary a couple of months ago, this is the citizen of the world presidency in which uh, the president feels himself uh, less like a manager of the American national interest and more a kind of global balloon floating over um, all, all the world. Uh, trying not to cast all that much of a shadow because the American shadow can be more harmful than it can be helpful. Um, so there is a foreign policy overarching tent, but in case by case by case, you have no effort to create any kind of a consistent approach. We're about to talk about Israel. Israel is the fundamental example of a country, uh, an ally of the United States towards which this administration has lurched from hostility to friendship to personal squabble to hugs to offense to friendship to here to there to last week the Secretary of State all but giving a green light to the enemies of the Jewish people in Israel to launch terrorist attacks in the form of a third intifada. This is a policy of no policy. And I'm not sure that we even have a parallel or an analog, certainly not in the post-war, post-World War II era, to anything like this. We know from this remarkable piece in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago that the president officially and specifically told Susan Rice, who was going to be his Secretary of State and is now his National Security Advisor, that she wished, he wished her, to manage American foreign policy in such a way as that it would limit American involvement. Now, American involvement is neither a good nor a bad. It is a fact. We are involved, we are the largest superpower in the world. We cannot uninvolve ourselves. And yet he believes, after five years of the presidency, that a president that can, that a, that a United States that can somehow have its fingers in fewer pies is a better United States, as though it were even remotely conceivable. But while you're talking about overarching policy, you also have to remember what underpins our policy. You talk about things that the United States should do with other countries. The reason they want to do things with us and the reason that we have influence in many cases is because they believe that we will protect them at the end of the day. So while we're talking about overarching policy, you also have to talk about security policy, not just in the Middle East, where we have withdrawn a lot of our, our military efforts. You have the Egyptians now talking to the Russians about air defenses. 
40 years ago, the Egyptians threw the Russians out of Egypt and brought the United States in. And now you have the Egyptians and the Russians talking about air defenses. The same is true everywhere in the world. If you look at what had been proposed as the pivot to China, the pivot to China was a way to reassure countries that we would be there for them. The Philippines, Japanese, uh, the South Koreans, the Taiwanese, all wanted the United States presence against their growing concern with China. Similarly, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Egypt, Israel, Jordan wanted the United States presence against what they perceived as a growing Iranian threat, and we have pulled out both places. I think we have, look, there's also an element, if I can just follow up on this. In, in the case of Iran, we see an administration that is in love with gimmicky policy. So in 2009, it wasn't just that we didn't back the, uh, you know, the Purple Revolution uh, after the stolen election. It was that there was a reason that we did not do so because of some cockamamie idea that was ginned up that if we only kept ourselves quiet, we could go to the Russians and the Russians would get the Iranians to sell them their fissile material and then the Russians could take it and then we could destroy it. The Russians weren't interested and the Iranians weren't interested. Similarly, we're now here in 2013 with this cockamamie proposal to slow down, to get the Iranians to agree not to really proceed all that much further just to get their signature on a piece of paper. This is a very odd and peculiar way to pursue policy. There is no positive except for the fact that you can claim to have had an agreement. In the agreement that was discussed last week, there's no benefit to the United States except for a signature on a piece of paper. Nothing. Not only not to Israel, certainly not to Israel, but, but not to us. This is one of the things I was speaking about on the air today, as a matter of fact. That the big benefit to the United States is the benefit to the administration, which um, has had, by its own admission, a difficult first year of a second term. And all of a sudden, this was going to be the crowning achievement, and he would finally earn his Nobel Peace Prize. And speaking of which, um, campaigning for a Nobel Peace Prize is uh, President Putin of, uh, of Russia. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's, 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 it's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. And uh, the outsourcing is generally, is generally uh, controversial, but President Obama has definitely outsourced our Syrian policy to uh, Russia. Um, Successfully, in your opinion, Daniel, and I, what is astonishing here is people are, are so riveted by the devastation right now in the Philippines, and it's truly terrible and it's all inspiring. There may be 10,000 people who have perished, a, a minimum of 120,000 people right next door to Israel. I mean, right next door have have perished. I um, I think people here might know. People listening to the show know. Uh, my friends know. My brother went on Aliyah. Uh, 23 years ago, and he and his four children uh, live in Israel, and, and literally with a, in a few miles of where they live, there is this massive slaughter that has occurred. What happens? What's the outcome? What are, what are the what are the worst case and best case scenarios for the United States of America uh, of the Syrian civil war? Before answering you. The situation in Syria has stabilized over the last seven, eight months, so that there is a Kurdish area to the northeast that has pretty much isolated itself from the rest of the country and is focused on Kurdish issues with Kurds in Turkey and turn Kurds in Iraq. Secondly, there is a stalemate between the anti-government forces and the government forces where the government controls mostly the central part of the country and the opposition controls the outlying areas. Um, the forces are basically Turkish-backed Sunni jihadis against Iranian-backed Shiite jihadis. To some of us, that suggests not such a bad situation. <laughs> Now, from the humanitarian point of view, it's horrible. It's not just 100 plus thousand who are dead, but roughly one third of the country has been displaced. Winter is coming. There are 
humanitarian crises all over. So it is a real concern to all of us who worry about the fate of innocents there. And I believe our focus should be on them, on helping them and helping the refugees and so forth. But it's not a bad thing that there is this stalemate. So to answer you, the best thing that can happen is that both sides lose. The worst thing that can happen is that one side, whether the government or the opposition, emerges triumphantly and controls Syria, dominates the country, and has a wind behind its back and can make all sorts of trouble for us, as well as many others, including Israel. I'd like to uh, offer a counter theory, which is that what we have seen largely as a result of American action is the uh, successful, first genuinely successful use of chemical weapons as a tool of civil war statecraft. What has happened is that Syria, Syria's chemical weapons attack on, on August 21st has led the United States and Russia, it used the weapons, it no longer needs them because it's in the government's enshrined position, which if the war continues, it will win, has now been stabilized. So the attack, focusing the horror and conscience of the world, ending up with the United States outsourcing its policy to Putin's Russia, Putin's Russia using uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad as its client, stabilizing his position in the fundament and in the lead, because we are obviously not going to involve ourselves any further with any, you know, offering any aid to the rebels, which, it, as Daniel says, may be a better policy than offering them aid to the rebels, but it does mean, in the larger picture, that a stalemate may be won because the Syrian government crossed that red line. Far from it being a failure, or a moment in which the world was forced by its conscience to act, this will be a landmark moment in which you can say that a country and other countries will learn that there may be positive benefits to using chemical weaponry in the way that Syria has. I disagree on two grounds. First, there have been prior civil wars where chemical weapons were used in the Middle East, namely the 1960s in Yemen and 1988 in Iraq. So this, and they paid no price. They just did it and nobody noticed. Nobody paid attention. Secondly, I don't think that this has helped Bashar al-Assad. I think that the chemical weapons have been his doomsday weapon, and the fact that he has to cough up at least some of them is not good for him. The fact that he's now under international scrutiny in a way he was not before August 21st is not good for him. I think that August 21st was a mistake from his point of view. It was a lashing out in anger because there was an assassination attempt I think if you ask Bashar al-Assad, will he take it back? He would take it back. He, he regrets having done it. It was a tactical mistake of the first order. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll reconvene in a year and we'll see who was right. Shoshana, if you were to uh, speculate, and, and that's part of what you have to do in a very unstable region in the world, uh, do you believe there are realistic chances of military confrontation involving uh, either Israel or the United States and some of the uh, Shia extremist forces in the region, either with Iran or with Hezbollah, uh, which functions as a, a semi-independent power? Israel has already taken military action against Hezbollah, both in Lebanon and in Syria. But if you're asking the question, what is the likelihood of Israel doing something military in Iran, I would make two points. First of all, they already have. The Israelis have been waging a military campaign in Iran, not of the sort that we tend to think about when we talk about hitting the nuclear arsenal. We tend to think about airplanes flying over Jordan and over Saudi Arabia to Iran and dropping bombs. That is not the mechanism by which Israel prosecutes this war. Rather, they have done computer warfare, cyber warfare. Things blow up in Iran with extreme regularity. There was, a, there was actually an explosion at the Arak heavy water plant last week. Because it's a closed site, it's been very hard to get information about what it was that blew up and the extent of the damage that was done. But if you judge by the Iranian reaction, is somebody made something blow up there that was very, very disconcerting to the Iranians. Um, Iranian nuclear scientists 
should pay their life insurance. They're very accident prone. <laughs> they, bad things happen with bicycles. Bad things happen. Bad things happen. Bad things happen to Iranian nuclear. Bad things weapons. happen to bad people. Indeed, they do, and sometimes they are orchestrated by good people. Right. So America is actually. What will be difficult is for Israel to take over military action against Iranian nuclear facilities. If they do that, it will almost inevitably draw the United States into some kind of military confrontation with Iran, one which I believe we are not very well prepared. We don't have the right assets. We don't have the right capability. Okay, last, last series of uh, comments on uh, American decline. Um, do, um, do defense cuts, which are currently scheduled as part of the sequester, uh, and this is not a partisan question at all, this is a question of national security, do those defense cuts threaten uh, America's security and role in the world? We have been cutting the defense budget for the last five years. It's not sequester. Before the sequestration, there were billions of dollars in defense cuts, and the answer is absolutely, entirely, and completely. Yes, if you don't have the capabilities, you cannot support your friends and allies. The pivot to Asia, which the president announced as a centerpiece of his policy, was dependent upon having ships and people to send to the Pacific. We didn't, we don't, we haven't sent them, we haven't pivoted. On the other hand, we have removed assets from the Middle East. Now, John, the horror, horror. Just, to, just to phrase the, put the yeah. question, and, and then, uh, you, you know that the other side, I shouldn't say the other side, people in favor of radical defense cuts. Um, you know, always say the United States spends more on our military than all the other nations of the world combined. How many aircraft carriers do we need? How many uh, advanced bombers do we need? How many fighter jets do we need? Why do we need a new generation? And the response? Well, the response is, uh, part of the response, not even to get into issues of American national security, involves Let's talk about the typhoon in the Philippines. 36 hours after the typhoon in the Philippines, massive amounts of aid have been deposited in the Philippines by the US military. Why? Because we are capable of projecting our forces tens of thousands of miles away from our borders, on ships, on aircraft carriers, by plane. This is extraordinarily expensive, and it is the single hinge on which any understanding of world order now depends because no other country is required by the understanding, the implicit understanding of how the world works to be able to cast its shadow 10,000 miles away from its border. No other country in the world is required by the understanding of its own people in its role, humanitarian as well as national security role, to be able to send tens of thousands of people tens of thousands of miles away it's from its borders. It's understand you, John. No one has the capability. There is no one with, a, with an aircraft carrier that can produce tens of thousands of gallons of potable water every single day. Exactly. They don't have it. Exactly. And, you know, the other interesting thing about um, American decline and the, and the embracing it by President Obama goes back to the sequester and the policy that led to the, the budget sequester in 2011. Obama put, believed that he had created a poison pill that Republicans could not swallow by insisting on across the board defense cuts as part of the sequester. Why? Republicans are hawks, Democrats are doves. Republicans will never accede to defense cuts of this draconian sort in which the good is cut with the bad. That's terrible. They will not assent to it. He is the President of the United States. He is the Commander-in-Chief of the military. He is the Director of American Foreign Policy. If the guy in charge says, we can cut across the board. It is not the place of 50, 47 Republican senators to say, no, sir, we're gonna stand against you because we, representing Arizona and Ohio and 
Pennsylvania, and Florida. We're going to stop you from doing that. That is not only preposterous, but deeply offensive. He has to design American foreign policy. He is the director of American military policy. The notion that Republicans were going to save him from his own bad policy and save the military from his own bad policy, supported by his own reckless and irresponsible allies who like defense cuts because they prefer them to domestic policy cuts, was an abrogation of the most fundamental executive responsibility and the most fundamental responsibility that any president has. And it will remain the signal embarrassment in historical terms of this presidency so far. Daniel Pipes. To pick up on a theme that both Shoshana and John have mentioned, the United States needs all these aircraft carriers and advanced aircraft uh, fighter planes because the United States maintains the world order. It is the analogy to our dollar being the fundamental currency maintaining the world economy. So our military, our, sea, our control of sea lanes and airspace is what allows commerce, and tourism, and uh, educational exchange, and so forth, to take place. So we are the linchpin of the world order. We pay money for this, but we also derive great benefits from it. It is a good deal for us. We have been doing this now since 1945, since we took it over from the British. It has worked well for us, and it has worked well for the world. We must continue with it. We have the second topic that uh, is listed in the title for tonight has to do with the new anti-Semitism or a rise of new forms of anti-Semitism. Uh, this is obviously far more acute in Europe and uh, certainly in the Islamic world than it is in the United States, but we here in the United States see um, even at August educational institutions like the University of Michigan, um, efforts at what's called BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction. And boycott, divest, and sanction, not such beacons of democracy as Cuba, North Korea, uh, uh, or Syria, but uh, the state of Israel. Uh, is this uh, properly understood, uh, Shoshana? as a new form of anti-Semitism, or just the same old uh, toxic wine in new bottles? It is itself the same old toxic wine, but it comes in a new package, it comes in a new bottle, where people have understood, particularly in college campuses and with social media, that you can create alliances that perhaps were not available to them before. Um, an organization like J Street, an organization unfortunately in some cases on college campuses like Hillel that make common cause with Muslim organizations, Islamic oriented organizations, providing cover for people who are traditional anti-Semites. A university would say, well, if J Street's involved, that's a Jewish organization, so it can't be so bad. Or if it's Hillel sponsors a program that brings someone to the campus that is a, a BDS sponsor, it can't be that bad, it's Jewish. So I think it is a very clever racket particularly on campuses, but elsewhere as well. Okay, this, this is one of the most amazing things. Uh, there, there's, people are probably aware of it. There is a major new, it is the first major new study of the American Jewish community in about 20 years by the Pew Research Foundation. And uh, it's the subject of a uh, important cover story in Commentary Magazine, uh, almost as important as the cover story that is appearing in the December issue that is uh, co-written by John Podhoris and myself. Um, look for it at, uh, at your local commentary source. Um, that was a shameless plug. But, um, oh, I'm going to be worse later. Okay, okay. Um, one of the most astonishing things in this entire Pew survey, and, and honestly, I, it's one of those things where you really want to slap your head. They asked American Jews, is Israel sincere? in seeking peace with the Palestinians. And the overwhelming majority of American Jews, American Jews, said no. 38% of American Jews said that uh, Israel is sincere in seeking peace with the Palestinians. 
How did we come to that? John Podoritz or Daniel Pipes? Well, that's the subject of the cover story in the November commentary, <laughs> which is actually available for free online at commentarymagazine.com, where we are running a pledge drive this week, where your dollar is matched dollar for dollar. But anyway, speaking of even more shameless plugs, the circumstance in which we find ourselves in the Jewish community is uh, that we are uh, ballasted and protected from the irresponsibility of our own views on Israel by the fact that in a historical first, uh, non-Jews in the United States are so overwhelmingly philo-Semitic that Jews are free to fantasize about escaping the necessity of a Jewish state, even as all of the demographic details that we are now seeing suggest the utter necessity uh, for the maintenance of the continued existence of this world's oldest civilization uh, in the strength and uh, uh, future history of the state of Israel. By which I mean, Jews can sit around and say, well, I don't know, I mean, Israel's very important, but it's so sad what they're doing to the Palestinians. Why? Because they have the luxury of the fact that alone, uh, among the countries of the world, 64 to 70 percent of Americans say they support Israel, and 7 to 9 percent of Americans say they support the Palestinians. That is not, those are not Jewish numbers, those are Gentile numbers, those are Christian numbers, those are numbers suggesting uh, the most remarkable transformation in the image and standing and character of a people in the history of the world. Uh, 67 years ago, after the, after the Second World War, there were real costs to being a Jew in the United States. You couldn't go to the college you wanted to. You were kept out of various professions. Um, if you wanted to marry certain types of people, uh, that would not be permitted. We now live in 2013, um, and the, uh, the joke that was once told by by Urban Crystal has now come true, which is they don't want to kill us, they want to marry us. Well, they want to marry us, and as our cover line says, they are loving us to death, because we now have a 70% intermarriage rate. So some, in other parts of the world, they're not so much loving us to death. That's right. Um, I, and, and this is another survey, which was a BBC survey that, thank God, did not get that much coverage in the United States, but the BBC did a major study on uh, the most popular nations on earth, the nations that were most respected and revered. Uh, anyone here care to guess the most popular nation on earth? No, Canada was second. Germany. Um, uh, ach, du lieber. Uh, Germany, the most popular nation on earth, and Israel was tied for the least popular nation on earth with North Korea. Um, uh, and with Iran rated somewhat more popular than Israel. Daniel Pipes, how did, how did we come to this situation? Uh, let me revert back to your original question, which is, is there a new anti-Semitism? Yes, I think there is. And there are three components mainly to that. First, the new anti-Semitism is mostly on the left, and historically it was on the right. Secondly, the new anti-Semitism is mostly Muslim, and historically it was Christian. And thirdly, to get to your question now, it is now about Israel primarily, it used to be about individuals. So three key ways it has changed, now the message is similar to what it was previously. Uh, and it is the isolation and focus on Israel that convinces people, including, as you suggested, many American Jews, that Israel has something wrong about it, that there is an original sin to it. Israel is conceived in an evil spirit, doing bad things to Palestinians. And this has become the widespread understanding of it, with the single great exception of Americans, who somehow or other see through this and understand that Israel is not conceived in sin, but conceived as virtuously as could be. I'd like to point out that Israel is the only 
only country in the world, only country in the world, which was established through purchase, bit by bit by bit, done by none of them. It was purchased. This country wasn't purchased, basically. Yeah, they were purchased later on, but the fundamentals of this country were grabbed. And so it is with every other country. Which leads me to my final point, that while there's a great deal of hand-wringing over left-wing Jews, and rightly so, there is a consolation. Yes, there are many left-wing Jews, some of whom are cruel or even hostile to Islam. But one has, in the United States, a very large body of Americans who are very enthusiastic about Islam. So yes, worry about the left-wing Jews, but note, in particular, the conservatives, the half of the country that's conservative. Which would you rather have? The 1% of left-wing Jews, 1% of Americans who are left-wing Jews, or the half of the country that is conservative. I would say that after the IDF, it is American Zionists, Christian Zionists, who are the second most important stalwart of Israel's defense. I, Shoshana, uh, there, there is a, um, a widespread belief in some sectors, even within the administration, even within government, even within sectors of opinion that could be described as libertarian, that if Israel would only agree to vacate the so-called settlements, the 450,000 Jews who have established their homes and in many cases uh, lived for 30 years and more in uh, parts of Judea and Samaria, that if only Israel would agree to do to those settlements what was done to the settlements in Gaza, that all of a sudden Israel's uh, status in the world would change immediately and maybe Israel would become almost as popular as Germany. To, uh, to, to that um, uh, notion, you say? Far be it for me to try to understand what goes on in the mind of the administration. <laughs> but yes, there are people who think that if only. The problem with the if only, as you pointed out, Michael, is that we have seen what happens when Israel departs territory. This is not a belief grounded in some, it's not a true belief. They don't really believe it. They really do not believe that if Israel actually left those houses built for Jews in places that they don't want them, that suddenly peace would break out. It is an excuse for saying, I wish to establish a Palestinian state. It's an excuse for saying, I'd like to cut Israel down to size. I do not think there is, and again, I'm not in the administration and they don't talk to me all that much. But I think it's safe to say that they really do not believe that it is houses for Jews in Judea and Samaria that drives the Arab, and particularly the Palestinian, but not only, animus toward Israel. It is a belief that Israel doesn't belong there. What you have is people who push a line that they fundamentally know is untrue. John Kerry did it this week when he said, do you want to be responsible for another intifada? Do you want Israel to take the, the burden of another intifada? It's not as if the intifadas that we've had so far have worked out well for the Palestinians, okay? The Palestinians lose every time there is a spasm of violence. They lose jobs, they lose access to the Israeli market. Uh, they lose all kinds of things that are basically important to, to human beings. And I think Secretary Kerry knows that. I think he was expressing a frustration with Israel because Israel was not in Beg to differ. I believe that the administration, as represented by Kerry and Obama and Hegel and Clinton and Petraeus and others, has consistently suggested that if only you could solve the Arab Israeli conflict, then the rest of the region's problems, the nuclear weapons, Egyptian economy, Syrian civil war, and so forth, would be easier to tackle. They have said this explicitly over and over again, and it's not the other way around. It is in their mind, I think this is silly, but this is what they think. And they've indicated over and over again that if, if the, the, the Arab Israel, the Palestinian Israeli problem, is the crux of the problem, deal with this. They're not saying that everything is the result of this. They're not so crude as to say that. But they're saying that this is the beginning. And if you can solve this, then the other things become. And thus the focus, the crazy focus, on the non-issue of Israeli-Palestinian relations, when Syria is in flames, Egypt is at the brink, Iran is about to build nuclear weapons, and Kerry has gone for what, the seventh or eighth visit to Ramallah and Jerusalem, and 
Susan Rice in a, in a recent uh, interview indicated there are only three issues on the administration's agenda. Iran, Syria, and Palestinian Israeli. This, this explains it. There is a logic. It's a faulty logic. It's a crazy logic. But it is, is but it, yeah. right, and it is, it is consistent. This is the interesting thing. So this is consistent with, obviously, the famous linkage policy that was the policy of administrations dating back from the Nixon administration forward. And then we had this discontinuity because, of course, the most destabilizing event to hit the United States, 9-11, happened as a result of uh, Saudi uh, exiles uh, in Afghanistan upset uh, at first because of the United States protecting the holy sites of Mecca striking the World Trade Centers, and as that indicates, we have the entirety of the Arab Spring having nothing whatsoever to do with Israel, and yet the passionate desire to pin the instability of the Middle East on this little country and the fight that is going on uh, as a result of incredibly foolish and dangerous policies taken up in 1948 and continued on to this day is a form of religion because it has now been conclusively disproven by world events for more than a decade and yet here we are back as though we stepped into a time machine and John Kerry sounds like James Baker. Okay, but there's a reason for it. If you're Petraeus or Kerry or any of these other people and you meet with leaders from the Middle East, they will begin every meeting with a five, ten minute rant about Israel, and they will tell you that things would be much easier for me to work with you if only there weren't this problem. And so you come away from meeting after meeting after meeting convinced that this is the case, that your relations with country X would be so much improved if only the Israelis were not building an Eastern Jerusalem government. And I would submit that they do that, in fact, and I've taken many of those same military officers after they've spent time in the Central Command drinking tea and hearing about the Israel problem. You take them to Israel and they have their heads turned, which is very nice. But I would submit to you, I know it's, it's the best thing I ever did. They, they get, I took a Marine General to Israel once who had spent six years in the Central Command, never got to Israel, talked to the Arabs, the Arabs kept saying, solve the Israel problem, solve the Israel problem, and the General assimilated that there was an Israel problem. Went to Israel and afterwards he called me and he said, it was very interesting, on the third day I woke up and I had an epiphany. There is no Israel problem. Son of a bitch, they're on our side. <laughs> That's what happens at one level. But I think at another level, I don't disagree with you on the way it looks. I believe that it's disingenuous. I think John Kerry knows that solving the Israel problem is not going to affect Iranian nuclear capabilities. I think they know it. And I think they dump on Israel because it's convenient because they have some belief that that's a place they can exercise their control. I gotta go with Daniel, because I think John Kerry's an idiot, and I say that <laughs> as, no, 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 I genuinely, this is, this is not, this is a view that I came to watching this interview on Israel television last week. When he said, do you want a third intifada? You think that was something that he intended to say? I do not think that it was something he intended to no, say. And, I and think... by the way, John, it's, it's like him stumbling into the conspiracism about the Kennedy assassination. He's That's... 74 years old. He's finally got to be Secretary of State. And he shoots his mouth off like he's a 22-year-old Senate aide. It's an embarrassment. <laughs> he didn't need to say it. It was no help, certainly less than any help to him. They don't need they don't need Jewish organizations abandoning them when they're when they're putting all this pressure on Jewish organizations to, to go silent on the Iranian deal, which is exactly what happened. Abe Foxman of ADL, who is a tower of jello at the best of times. <laughs> Abe Foxman, he's a nice guy, I like him, but he's a tower of jello. Abe Foxman, who was browbeaten into keeping his mouth shut in Iran, suddenly Sunday says, All right, I'm off this. Why? Because Kerry put his, put his foot in his mouth. I don't think that Kerry knows that linkage is wrong. I think Kerry is a boob who believes the standard issue 
conventional wisdom nonsense that has been driving the foreign policy community for 30 or 40 years, in which one hoped, simply because of the nature of reality, had been, you know, sort of shuffled to one side. Meanwhile, there's Israel, right? Israel just had an election last year, correct? What was the issue in the election? Drama, there's, every movie is about the Palestinians and the novels and David Grossman goes and cries and almost always pulls his heart out of his chest. The entirety of the Israeli election was about domestic issues for the first time since before 1967. What were the issues that drove the, that drove the minor parties, right? Economic matters, um, Orthodox, you know, questions of Orthodox citizenship and, and, and participation in the military, not the struggle with the Palestinians, which had no role in that country's own election. What is going on in the Palestinian polity? Is the, Palest is the struggle within the Palestinian polity such as it is about Israel? No, it's a power struggle between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is in tatters, it can't get a prime minister, it has one, he resigns, he comes back, he resigns, he does this, and everybody in America is all in love with the one politician in, 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 in all of Palestinian politics who has no support in Palestine. We all love Salam Fayyad, he's great, he's a serious guy, he knows the score, and 12 people support him. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, just one final word. Yes, although it's Wait. early in John Kerry's Secretary of State ship, he came in at the beginning of this year, I will go out on a limb and nominate him as the worst Secretary of State ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, which is that nothing I have said should be construed as defending Secretary Kerry. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. We, um, we intended no such slur on her. One of, one, of, one of the ways, and, and, and when people in Hollywood actually see foreign policy better than the Secretary of State, and you know you're in trouble, um, there's a screenwriter, a successful comedy writer actually, named Brett, Brett Polutsky, who says the problem with administration policy in the Middle East is the administration is far more upset about some guy building a house in Jerusalem than they are about another guy building a bomb in Tehran. And that, that only crystallized the situation very effectively. All right, last little round of questions, then we will open it up to your questions and comments. And I know you're eager for that. Um, the, the final installment in our three-part topic was the fate of Israel. Let's broaden it to the fate of the Jews. And uh, because uh, I, I do think that almost everybody who's involved in Jewish life in the United States has to have taken a look at this Pew study uh, at the shape of Jewish population trends, trends of Jewish involvement, and to have uh, begun to wonder what the future is likely to hold. A couple of questions. Um, Given that, that Israel is now the largest Jewish community in the world, and, and by a pretty good measure of advantage, and it's the first time in 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years, because the community in Alexandria used to be huge, but the, the, the largest Jewish community in the world is in Judea, Israel. It's a remarkable. But given that that is the case, and that the center of Jewish creativity and, and religiosity and uh, culture of any, any measure has shifted from the United States to Israel. Does the fate or future of the American Jewish community in which we all choose to live our lives, does that fate matter to our sometimes literally brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael? Yes. I mean, it matters very much on the great uh, threat uh, that the demographic trends suggest is that the American Jewish community is dissolving itself uh, slowly right uh, at the time at which um, Israel's future uh, is going either to be secured or it is going to be threatened and destroyed existentially. So think about what I mean by this. 
Over the next 10 years, Iran is either going to go nuclear or it is not. And over the next 10 years, Israel is going to become a massive exporter of natural gas. One of the world's largest reserves of natural gas is currently being, the field is being prepared. Israel, like the United States, is, has, has found this miraculous new storehouse of world energy. Israel is poised to become a wealthy, important, stable country supplying the world, which is growing and, f and first worldizing and modernizing um, with necessary materials. To the extent that they can solidify that, and to the extent that Iran can be prevented from threatening Israel militarily, you know, existentially, as we're talking about, the entire dynamic of, the, of Jewish history will be altered from being a tiny, impoverished people dependent on strangers. It will be a wealthy, small people uh, with every incentive to create comedy and peace and, 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 and a common market around the people that it's going to supply the energy to. So, so the question, John, is why, why is it important for that future if the American Jewish community dwindles? The, the Russian community, Russia used to have over 2 million Jews. The most recent population uh, estimate of the Jewish population in Russia, anybody know? It's 230,000. It's unbelievable. Uh, and they're, this is in all of Russia. Um, okay, so why would it matter significantly to Israel if here in the United States, Daniel Pipes, uh, the American Jewish community wasn't approximately 5 million, but became 1 million or less? Uh, I think the key role of American Jews for Israel has been to articulate and uh, inspire support for Israel. That half of the American electorate that is ardently pro-Israel is deeply influenced in the first place by the Jews who have the knowledge, have the first-hand experience, and the conviction to explain this. So. That is, I think, on the political level, the important thing. Might I just take a step in that same direction that John did and talk about Israel for a second? He emphasized the natural gas, which is significant, but there's a whole lot else going on in Israel that is also very significant and very positive. Israel is the only rich country, member of the OECD, that has a more than replacement rate demographically. France is second best. We need 2.1 children per woman. France is second best with 2.08. United States is 2.06. Israel is 2.67. No, overall, overall 2.67, including Aberdeen, Arabs, everyone. Can you lift up your microphone? It's hard to hear. Israel has the highest uh, men's longevity in the world. Israel has stopped illegal immigration. Israel has the highest economic growth in the last five years since the Great Recession of any advanced industrial economy, way ahead of anyone else. For example, we've had 2.5% aggregate growth. Israel's had 14.5%. Israel has uh, by far the best water policies in the world. Ten years ago, it had a water crisis. Now, between new techniques of uh, desalinization and recycling, it is the by far the world's leader in uh, education. It is the second best educated country in the world after Canada. Uh, diplomatically, it has relations with 156 out of 193 countries. So whatever you look at, you find that with the single exception of WMD, in particular the Iranian nuclear buildup, Israel is doing very, very well. If I can, just a... a um A story in that regard, my, my brother Jonathan, my younger brother, is a very prominent venture capitalist in Israel who has been very prominently involved. You can read about him in the books, uh, The Israel Test or Startup Nation, 
which is based on my brother's slides. And my, my brother actually had the opportunity recently to make a presentation about Israeli companies for Chinese investors uh, in the People's Republic, which is kind of amazing. And he was speaking there, and he was saying, as he always does, and it's pretty remarkable, that of all the nations on Earth, on what they call the tech-heavy NASDAQ exchange, of course, most of the companies on the NASDAQ are American companies. But the second highest number of companies on the NASDAQ is Israeli. There are more Israeli companies on the NASDAQ than Japanese or German or, um, uh, or, or French or Canadian or anything else. So he was making this point, and people there were ooing and eyeing, and he said, and what's remarkable is you think about it, there are more Israeli companies than Chinese companies, and there are 1.4 bil uh, billion people here, and in Israel, we are only 8 million. And, uh, and when, he, when he sat down, someone said, he said, you, you make a mistake, you make a mistake. You say that Israel, only 80 million people? <laughs> and my, my friend said, no, no, not 80 million people, 8 million. And people laughed. They thought he was joking. But, but this is, uh, and, and apparently this is one of the things that is also fascinating is throughout Asia, and I, I, I haven't traveled in Asia, my brother has a great deal, um, the exaggerated view of Israeli power in the world and, and the obsession with things Jewish in South Korea and Japan and even in the People's Republic, is extraordinary. And, and you talk about some Zionist dreams actually reaching fruition. Uh, the idea of the, the kind of life uh, that, that, that a typical, ordinary, working Israeli can live today is uh, the kind of life that very, very few people in other countries can, can experience. Now, this is the spur to the new anti-Semitism, which is to say, as long as Jews are victims, as long as Jews are living in the shadow of six million murdered, as long as Jews are huddled together against 22 Arab nations that wish to destroy it and do it ill, those Jews are fine. <laughs> those Jews you can sympathize with. Those Jews you can support. Let Israel get strong. Let Israel defeat those nations in 67. Let Israel survive 73. Let Israel go into Lebanon in 82. Let Israel grow. Let Israel become an economic power. Let this tiny country of 8 million, you know, what is it, 6 million Jews out of 8 million, let this tiny country become a force to reckon with. And suddenly, the world, yet again, we're talking about six million out of six billion, 0.1% of the world's population. A tiny fragment left of this people. And this goes to the question of the role of American Jews. Because if you look at a country like Great Britain, Mike, where you mentioned the poll that has Israel at the bottom of the pile with North Korea as a public opinion matter, the government of Great Britain has just signed major new technological agreements with the government of the state of Israel to capitalize on Israeli technology. There's a dichotomy between what people understand that Israel can do and that they want to benefit from, and yet there is an undercurrent of distaste, partly based, I think, John, on what you said, but also based on old anti-Semitism, which is the role that the United that Jews around the world need to play. There is not a terrifically organized, politically active Jewish community in Great Britain. There is not this ability to go to the, to the people and make Israel's case, as Daniel will point out, that Jews have done historically here with the, with the evangelical community. And you see what happens. The British government may understand the benefits of Israel, but the British public thinks it's North Korea. So that's part of our role here, is to continue to talk about Israel in the positive sense and make sure that the people who make the policies understand the benefits that Israel brings to the world. Right now, demographically, why does it matter that the Jewish community is in decline in the United States? It matters because it matters. Connecting it to other larger forces, geopolitical needs of Israel and all that, it matters because the history of the Jewish people is the world's greatest miracle. It is the greatest miracle in history that this tiny tribe enslaved in a foreign land, escaping from that foreign land, settling itself amongst a bunch of hostile tribes, 
all of which are lost in the sands of history. The Amalekites, the Hittites, every, every weird name that you can come up with in the Bible, every tribe, the Samaritans, they're all gone. This tiny group of people, this teeny little remnant has survived. The Romans, the Greeks, you know, the Inquisition, the British Empire, the ghetto of the ghetto of Venice, the Holocaust. It is the Crusades. Every possible effort to drown it and strangle it. Are we going to sit here and assent to its decline in the United States simply because our lives are too comfortable? After Michael, Michael just told me that he has been working on a documentary about the historicity of the Exodus, that is to say, new evidence that the Exodus, at following controversies about whether or not it actually ever took place, there is now increasing evidence that it did, archeological evidence. Think about what that means. We have a direct connection to everything that we have ever read about in the Bible. And we American Jews are going to sit here and say, ah, it's too difficult to make sure that our kids don't marry out of the faith, or it's too, I don't want to insult anybody. I don't, you know, don't make anybody feel bad. So these rules, this, the rules that have governed this people, that kept this people alive for thousands of years, are just going to be traduced and abandoned and thrown up by the wayside to make everybody feel good today, while those very rules are what kept the Jews alive, and while, they're, while the communities ascent in their degradation and their, and their slow uh, becoming irrelevancy, have only increased the speed with which American Jewry is in decline. Are we just gonna sit here and let that happen? Are we gonna piss away 3,000 years because America's too nice to us? This is, in, this is in our hands. This is in every single person's hands. This is a small community. And there are things that can be done. We know what can be done. We actually do know what can be done. This is a matter of connecting us to the deepest part of not only our humanity, our history, but the world's history. The fundament of Western civilization. The fundament of civilization itself. The seven Noahide laws. The originating rules of civilization which come from us, from us. And if we go, Israel must stay. But our going over the next hundred years is a tragedy. It's not a natural development, and it is something, as Daniel said about American foreign policy, we do not have to ascend to. This is the result of bad policies, bad ideas, bad decisions that people have been making that can be reversed. And let us, let us not make a bad decision here and foreclose the possibility of uh, people asking your questions and joining the conversation. So I think we have um, a microphones, roving microphones, do we? Yes, let's, uh, I think there's a gentleman here in the aisle. Hold on. And uh, microphone coming your way. In your, when you started, Michael, you made some kind of, you, you made a reference to the uh, nature of the challenging questions that a Jewish community might make. Do you recollect that statement? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, here's a Gentile, and I'm asking you with all the statistics, Southern Baptist Gentile, and all the statistics about the future of Israel, where does God play a role? God is the role. It was the American Jewish communities pulling away from God that is largely the cause of the American Jewish community's decline. And it is Israel's increasing embrace of God and the interweaving of God in what was a radically secularist conception of the state at its origin that has led to its demographic strength. And, and if, if I may say, we were to, one of the things that we are, that Israel has been described, Israel, the people Israel, the Jewish people, 
as God's stake in history. Uh, there was a best-selling book in the 1960s called Jews, God, and History by Max Gaiman. It argued, and very persuasively, that the strongest proof of God's existence in the world is that he has kept his promises to the Jewish people, promising both hardship and exile and return and revival. And that has come eminently true. And that is why the most ironic, and to me the most upsetting aspect of that entire Pew study that we were talking about was in America at large, they asked people, are you certain of God's existence? In America at large, among our Christian brothers and sisters and everybody who lives in this country, 69% said, yes, we are certain of God's existence. Among American Jews, 34%. That is something, and I would agree with your sentiments, about which we must be concerned and take some action. Uh, next question. Uh, okay. Two quick questions on Iran. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank the panel. You guys are just excellent. But my two questions are, first, is there any historical evidence that a totalitarian power has ever honored a armament agreement? <laughs> Secondly, why does no one talk about the thousands of Americans who have been killed and maimed by Iranian terrorist bombs during the war against terror? We've seen, in 1944, General Franco had attacked American troops. The United States would have plastered Spain into a pile of rubble, and yet we have allowed the Iranians to murder American soldiers with impunity. Why? Well, to ask the first question is to answer it. No, totalitarian leaders or even dictators do not keep their promises. Uh, why do we not focus on the American casualties and deaths at the hands of the Iranians? I'm not sure it's in the thousands, but certainly there are plenty. Um, we don't because um, our government has been now for two decades been trying hard to find an agreement with the Iranians. This didn't just start last weekend in Geneva. For example, Bill Clinton had the roadmap in 1998. Uh, there's been a persistent effort to come to terms with the Iranians and say, look, let's be grown-ups. You've got your system, we've got ours, but we can work together. The, 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 it hasn't worked, of course, but that is the dream. What's so interesting is that the American people as represented by Congress, is consistently against this. So you have the State Department leading the charge towards accommodation and uh, rapprochement on the one hand, and you have the Congress on the other hand saying, no, no, no. And so far, the Iranians have helped the Congress by keeping its hostile policies in place as recently as this weekend. You're okay, ne next question. My question relates to the Islamists and the prospect of possibly defeating them, specifically with reference to the, what's going on in Egypt. And I guess my question is, can uh, the military regime consolidate its power and conclusively defeat the Muslim Brotherhood, the local branch of the uh, Islamists? Is their um, campaign, if you want to call it that, popularly supported and if the answer to both of those questions is yes, what are the implications for defeating the Islamists globally? Okay, by, by the way, we will be finished here within 10 minutes, okay? So uh, uh, no need to be alarmed. And we will have quick answers if we can to quick questions. Yes, the Egyptian government can defeat the Islamists. Uh, it has enormous popular backing in trying to do so. Should it succeed, this will have enormous implications for other governments elsewhere. Uh, next question on this side. Hi, thank you again for coming. Uh, I know this has been mostly about foreign policy, but to take some domestic policy and move it into a foreign policy that we're, we're bankrupt as a country uh, morally and financially. And I think, you know, in our welfare state, no matter who is next, you know, Mitt Romney was not going to change much financially. 
America is in decline, and how are we going to defend our neighbors like Israel? We're not going to have the money. Uh, we are not bankrupt. I mean, let's, let's, we are in a period of slow growth, but we are growing. And we are growing less quickly than we could because we have bad policies. And the simple reality is that the coming entitlement crash is going to force upon us practical policy decisions that will not only not hurt us, but will end up straightening us out for the century to come. Remember, this country is the wealthiest country on earth. It has twice the GDP of China. You keep hearing that China's about to overtake the United States. We have twice the GDP of China. We are now $17.5 trillion a year. We are not broke. We can afford our military. We can afford to be the world's great power and to do it the right way. We are choosing not to. And if we get ourselves out of the funk that we're in, which is largely the result of bad policy choices, we will be able to do that, and we should do that, and my guess is we will do that. And, and by the way, people should keep in mind that as a percentage of our GDP, our defense spending is not anywhere near its historic highs. It reached its historic highs in the 1950s and 60s, and, and, and then again was high in the 1980s. But as a percentage of GDP, defense spending is radically down. And uh, whatever America's economic problems, it is impossible to actually look at the numbers and to blame them on our spending for security. Let's take three more questions very quickly, and then we will say good evening and be very glad to talk with you. By the way, information about Jewish Policy Center, and we'll be in the lobby uh, signing books. But, Thank you. Uh, so many questions in so little time. Question about the two-state solution negotiations. As they continue to go around in circles, what are the alternatives? You, Shoshana? Have, you have at the moment three states between the Mediterranean and, and the Jordan River. And the question for the two-state solution is which one of those three will disappear? If somebody could answer that. Now, there are those who would like Israel to disappear. I doubt it. How you deal with the remaining two Arab states is the real question. I don't see any hope for a two-state solution. I don't see any hope for a three-state solution. If you broaden the parameters and bring in Jordan, you have four states. Um, you can't get to a two-state solution from here. Can I quickly just... Eventually, there will be a two-state solution. The Palestinian polity is a psychotic, politically psychotic political institution that promises its people things that it cannot deliver and provides them with emotional pornography that will never satisfy their national aspirations. This will not continue forever. Something will change, but we cannot hasten the change. We cannot force their spiritual change. They will have to change themselves. Two, two final questions. Um, my question is Russia's role. Uh, obviously, Russia is uh, in discussions with Egypt right now, but obviously exploring their influence. Uh, given uh, the American uh, administration now, hostility toward Israel, uh, what are the, is it in Israel's interest to begin discussions with Russia? Okay, that's question one, and question two, final question. And we'll, we'll answer that in a moment. Oh, a gentleman here, and then we'll get the gentleman there. Ask these two questions at once, and then we'll do them boom, 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 okay? In the, in the light of all that's been said so far today, and the question I would like to ask is, why is the majority of American Jews still supporting Obama? In the, it's in the same vein as his question. Why didn't the Jewish community make an effort to vet Obama and to understand and make the Jewish community realize Obama and to read books and present articles and broadcasts on this man? Nobody in this room knows who he is. 
Okay. Um, uh, the first question about Russia, Daniel, do you want to take that question? What? What? Why? The question basically is, uh, given some difficulties with the United States, is it likely that Israel will do a rapprochement with the regime of President Putin? The Israelis are looking around the world for new allies, India, China, Russia in particular. That's all a good idea, but of course none of them can replace the United States, and specifically Russia cannot replace the United States. And let, let me conclude by, by answering the, the question that was placed about Barack Obama. Um, look, this is not a partisan evening, really it's not. And, um, and he is the President of the United States. He will continue to be the President of the United States until January 20th, 2017. Um, that's, that's the reality of our lives. And it's, it's one that we respect. And uh, as patriotic Americans, um, we, uh, we want our country to succeed and to be strong. Uh, the, the one thing about and it's the most common question that I get. Uh, John's father wrote a very good book about it, which is Why Are Jews Liberal? It's an interesting book. Uh, and it's a very long book. <laughs> and it goes back to the French Revolution. And that's a long question. The, the simplest answer that I have found as to why American Jews uh, were so overwhelmingly supportive of Barack Obama, first of all, much less so in this last election, the, uh, the Jewish percentage for Obama fell more than his percentage in any other community. Uh, Mitt Romney got a higher percentage of Jewish voters than any Republican candidate since Ronald Reagan, which, which, which does say something. The, the other thing is that uh, my friend Rabbi Daniel Lappin has a very good line on this, is the reason that so many Jews are so instinctively liberal is to rebut all of those stupid superstitions about the superior intelligence of Jewish people. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very intelligent audience. Thank you very, very much for your attention.